agnostics, skeptics, humanists, uh, whatever you like to call yourself, you are welcome here. So most atheists are humanists, but not all humanists are atheists. And we choose to use the word atheists because you'll never hear anything supernatural I talked about um, from, from the podium. So we're in our second week of a series on the book Crucial Conversations, Tools for Talking When the Stakes Are High and People Are Feeling Emotional. Basically, we want to be brave enough to have conversations that matter. And so um, we had hoped that this book would be a tool uh, to help us do that. And um, I'm always looking for good material, good books. So, uh, we were talking about it a little bit before we got started. Um, we're always open to getting people's suggestions. And we invite anyone who wants to to, to get a talk with us. So, last week we talked about the most important part of being an effective uh, conversationalist, and that's taking personal responsibility for your role in the conversation. And so if you will indulge me, I'll give just a two-minute recap of what we covered last week. Um, because 90% of everything is all about personal responsibility. And that's where the good stuff happens. The first thing is that um, individually we need to make sure that the crucial conversations happen. And second, during those conversations, we need to be aware of our own conversational style. What is it that we do when we get into conversation? Um, am I a person that uses withdrawing tactics uh, to be able to feel in control of the conversation? Or am I a person who gets aggressive um, to manipulate a conversation? And it's really important to own that whatever your style is, um, you do that because it's your tactic. Not because somebody else made you that way. So somebody else didn't make you act belligerent. Somebody else didn't make you withdraw. Um, I withdrew because it's, it's the thing that I do, right? And we want to take responsibility for that. Third, we want to monitor our physiological states during conversations. So we notice sensations as they arise and stay present to them. We want to have enough awareness that we don't go from tightness in our throat to choking out some hurtful thing. We want to be able to just be like, ah, oh, feeling tightness in my throat and breathe. Just stay there. Um, it keeps the conversation, um, keeps you more in control of yourself. So that's what we covered last week. And then afterwards, we sat in our discussion circles and um, and I, and I wanted to just mention that last week in discussion, I heard some things. Usually some really good stuff happens in the discussion circle. And was, I got something that I was able to kind of work on all week long. Okay, so someone said, um, we were talking about the importance of everybody contributing their point of view into the shared pool of meaning. And someone said, Everyone's point of view is worth considering um, because it is their point of view. That's enough. Okay? Not based on judgment that it's correct, but that every person has a right to whatever they're feeling, whatever they're thinking. And I remember thinking um, that if we could all relate to each other from that place with that much respect, then this would be one of the safest places that we could be. And it would be it would be wonderful. So um, for me, trying to live that this week, um, I was able to be in conversation with someone and not feel like I had to judge what they were saying or correct what they were saying. Um, not in that moment. I could just listen because sometimes somebody just wants to be heard, and that is a very heart-centered way of dealing with people. So um, now moving on to the book, Crucial Conversations Part 2. Um, this week we're talking really about what we can actually do to have the conversation with the other person and increase our possibility that it will go well. So the first thing we do is we start with heart. Starting with heart means that we have, um, we, we remember what we want from the conversation. 
what do we really want for ourselves and for the other person? And we need to act as if we're committed to having what we really want. But some people fight nasty, and they want to win at all costs. But when we start with heart, we realize that it's not worth it to win a fight and lose the relationship. We want to notice when other people start acting out and realize that it's a sign they don't feel safe in the conversation. And, and to know that we need to create safety. So that's a huge change from the way that people usually interact in conversations. Usually if somebody starts getting nasty, then, you know, like it's on. Uh, instead of triggering that, um, coding it that this is a sign that this person doesn't feel safe and I need to figure out how I can create more safety so that the conversation can happen. Uh, instead of acting like a matador who's just waved the red tape in front of my nose, uh, I need to think, you know, what can I do to make this conversation safe so that we can continue? What are some ways that we can build safety? First, apologize if it is appropriate. Second, use contrasting. So contrasting is a, a, a thing to do where you first point out what you don't want to have happen, and then you come follow up with what you do want to see happen. So here's an example. I don't want to put you in an uncomfortable situation, um, but we need to make our, sa our sales quota so you know everyone has to make sales calls. Yeah. So you know, start out with kind of acknowledging the concern that a person ha has at the context they take. Don't want this, but do want this. You can rebuild safety by looking at your own stories and seeing if you can update that. So the book says there are three versions of stories. Um, I of uh, unhelpful stories, and I basically think they're really kind of boiled down to one one unhelpful story. So we can believe that we are the victim, we can believe the other person is a villain, and we can believe that we're helpless. When we tell ourselves those stories, it really gets us to be unproductive. And for me that's, uh, if, I, if I am the victim and you are the villain, I see that as two sides to one story, and if I am helpless, that's just another victim story. How do you get out of a victim story? First, acknowledge your own role in the problem. Take responsibility for it. Acknowledge when we have violated our own rules. And instead of acting like a victim, accept responsibility. For whatever I have done to contribute to this situation that I find myself in. When I step up and take responsibility, it builds trust with the other person, and it's a signal that this is a conversation for grown-ups. Uh, here's an example. I should have been tracking the sales more carefully, and um, I can help you guys. We'll do some more trades later um, to get ready for making the new sales call. So you acknowledge my role in the problem, didn't make the other person a victim, and moved out of helplessness into solution. But what do you do if you really think the other person kind of is a villain? I mean, they just, their behavior stinks. What we can do when we think the other person has behaved very badly is we can ask ourselves, why would a reasonable person behave this way? And instead of assigning the worst possible motives to someone, we try to assign good motives, uh, good reasons. Maybe we try to discover their reasons. And even if they, what they're doing really is kind of just unreasonable, they themselves don't even know why they're behaving the way they're behaving, that acting as if the other person is reasonable helps us to stay in productive dialogue. Blaming and shaming is not productive. So some people have the idea that when you blame and you shame, um, that you are on the path of changing from this behavior. But after that builds resentment and it destroys trust. So we want to create a collaborative, safe environment stay out of blame and shame um, and try to act like the other person's reasonable. Uh, hopefully, you know, they, they will get on board and start being reasonable. So I'm going to walk us through uh, a really, you know, how to have a productive day. 
first start with humility. Start with the idea, leave open the possibility that you're wrong. Um, and even if you know, you're definitely not wrong and the solution, there's already a solution that we're all going to have to implement, you can at least acknowledge the other person's role that it take, it's going to take two to, to make something happen. So stay humble. Then you state your facts as clearly as possible. Stick with your facts and give just enough story to explain why you're telling the facts. Uh, for example, uh, as an actor, you might meet with your acting coach and your manager and say, look, I've been on this many casting calls. That's a fact. Then you tell just enough of the story. I'm kind of disappointed. I would have thought I had a job by now. And that way people know what the facts, why you were telling them that. And then ask others to share their side of the story. And that could be as simple as, like, what do you, what do you think is going on here? As you talk, encourage the testing of ideas. Let's say the manager says, you're trying for all these leading roles and you do much better as a comedic psychic. Just follow with a question. Has any director ever told you that? Uh, or do you think I'm particularly funny? What might I do to become a leading actor? All of that. So let's just say an upset happens, misunderstanding. So we can use our contrast technique. Um, which is not the same as apology, it's just like, um, hey, I, I didn't, I, I don't want you to feel like I just blew off our meeting, um, but I took the morning and was trying to look for extra budget for us, right? So, um, not this, but that, contrasting. And remember that listening is an active verb. So, um, you, Sometimes you feel like somebody needs to talk or you know you need to talk to somebody, but they're just kind of clammed up, they're kind of withdrawn. So you first you need to draw them out and solicit their opinions regularly to give them a chance to kind of think about it in between meetings and um, how they might want to talk about things. When they do talk, listen. The thing that we often do is that we start thinking about our response, what we're going to say, and we forget that um, to just be wholly present and listen to each other. We can break a cycle of violence and dialogue. If we're on the receiving end, of cheap shots, or aggressive behavior, or whatever, break the cycle by not responding in kind. So, by the way, one way that people often get confused is if somebody's being aggressive and I'm being passive. I might think that they are the only one who's being dysfunctional. But, but if I'm withdrawing uh, or evading and whatever, then I'm also behaving in a dysfunctional way. And so we need to be able to, both of us, manage our emotions and, and have a discussion. Um, we want to find where we can agree and agree to as much as we possibly can. Don't fake it, but find the places where we do agree. And that's to build a solid foundation of the relationship. Uh, crucial conversations are a series of conversations. It's a mistake to think we're going to meet once and hash everything out, and if that didn't happen, then it was a failure. Because we have to build that foundation of trust with each other by finding our mutual places of agreement, okay? Now, if we're going to make decisions, we need to um, compare our differences. In a, in a dispassionate, non judgmental way. Anna has this idea, Joe has this idea. Let's discuss the pros and cons of each idea. But, even if everything goes as well as possible, talks often break down at the very end. Everything was going great, here's a real life example, and the client and I were super excited about that, what I was going to build for her. And then we had to just finalize and get the budget signed. Uh -oh. So not all conversations do require a decision, but when we are talking about our crucial conversation skills, we need to have the ability to also make and execute on decisions. Here are some problems. We don't know how the decision is going to be made, um, and once decisions are made, sometimes we have problems with execution. So, First, decide in advance how decisions are going to be made. Not everything is made by democratic vote. 
Uh, so let people know who is going to be making the decision so you know, people don't get hurt later. And if we're in charge and we turn something over to someone else, know in advance how the decision is going to be made and a rough timeline and all that kind of thing. Um, this prevents people from making decisions but never executing. Sometimes there's an authority who will make the decision and we have conversations ahead of time just to consult each other to have input into the decision. Um, and we can make decisions by voting, okay? When all the decisions, when all the options are pretty good uh, and everyone's agreeable, they're just going with a vote, decide by vote. Only very rarely do we need to have consensus uh, where everyone must agree. Because um, don't assume that consensus is the best way, the most democratic way. Yes, I had to use a people laugh and you might have had this experience. And I have had this experience where I had, uh, we knew a manager who felt every single person had to say yes. who would come to pretty much agreement and said moving forward, the whole thing would unravel as we tried to get every single person to agree. And um, misapplied seeking consensus can be a horrible waste of time. After decisions are made, make assignments, put plans into action, figure out the who, what, where, when, and don't let good ideas just float around in space and dissipate. But ultimately, the only way for these techniques for crucial conversations to work is that two or more people have to agree to be in dialogue. But when you're having disagreements, be grateful. Be grateful that your partners are committed to being in dialogue with you. Because the worst thing that can happen is they just, you know, just complete shut down and hit a wall. So I, I wanted to conclude by saying that I'm really grateful that we get together every week and we discuss cool things. And I celebrate the heart-centeredness of our group, our willingness to be open with each other and listen, first without judgment, so we all have a little breathing room to explore new ideas. And I have a standard closing that I use, um, which is atheists, believe in good. Because good works in non-mysterious ways. <laughs> <laughs>